how do I accept this? Time does heal. So I have to allow the process to take place. I have to let go of this anger. I guess I have to start by forgiving myself. My mom wouldn't want me to feel this way. Her beautiful soul reminds me that, that life, life has so much more to offer. I'm allowed to grieve. I have to remember that. Grieving is hard, but when you hold on, it's damaging. I don't know what's ahead of me, but what was cannot go with me. So grateful to have a God that can help us in our moments that when life gets heavy, He won't put more on us than we can bear. We celebrate that God. Will you whisper a word of prayer with me? God, we thank you again for the love you extend towards us and how you continually uplift, sustain, and strengthen. And Lord, we simply are grateful that in our weak moments, you have proven yourself to be strong. So now, God, we admit that over the last few weeks, it has been hard and it's wore us down. It's taken us places as we have been navigating through what grief looks like. So, God, I just simply ask that as we come to the conclusion today that the seeds that we've sown, and the moments that we felt, and the weight that has accompanied us on this journey, God, just provide us strength. Provide us peace. Provide us comfort that only comes from you. Lord, I pray now as I stand that you would give me strength and clarity. I admit, God, it's been a very difficult series. Lord, I'm grateful with your help that we've been able to push through. And I pray that even as I have tried to share my pain, it has been helpful to others. So bless it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, we're coming down to the conclusion and climax of our series, Good Grief. If it has blessed you on our tab global platforms, let us know in that comment section. Just say, I really needed this, Pastor. And if you're here within our in-person worship experience, let me know as well. I hope it has been helpful. Uh, it has been extremely hard. Not just preaching it. I, preaching it is almost kind of the easier part of the series. It's the preparation for this series that has been hard. It's been heavy, and so I'm grateful for your prayers that pushed us through. Uh, it's not an easy topic to cover, and oftentimes we don't like to talk about especially in the context of Sunday worship, um, but I feel that it has been a place of healing and help, and it has been a place of hope as well. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been navigating through a variety of ways we've been trying to look at grief from pushing through the tears as we examine the silence of Saturday, and we've been challenged to not throw away our heart. Today, I invite you to 2 Samuel chapter 21. There's a couple of verses I'm going to read, verses 10 through 13, as we come to the conclusion of this series. Now, let me go and tell you it's not a neat conclusion. Um, it's not a wrap-up conclusion. Um, I'm just ending the series. <laughs> Amen. Um, um, so it's, it's not one of those neat, finely wrapped ones, because we know that grief is not neat. It's never kind of an easy thing to deal with. So 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 10 through 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Hear the words of God for us on today. Then Ritzba, daughter of Ai, the mother of two of the men, spread burlap on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest season. She prevented the scavenger birds from tearing at their bodies during the day and stopped the wild animals from eating them at night. When David learned what Ritzba, Saul's concubine, had done, he went to the people of Jabesh Gilead and retrieved the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan. When the Philistines had killed Saul and Jonathan on Mount Gilboa, the people of Jabesh Gilead stole their bodies from the public square of Beth Shan where the Philistines had hung them. So David obtained the bones of Saul and Jonathan as well as the bones of the men of the Gibeonites had executed. 
Look again at this text. We're introduced to a woman by the name of Ritzpa. You're seeing a period of intense grief and pain. She's having to mourn, watch this, the loss of her sons who have been taken in a very horrific and gruesome way. And I want to make the argument today this was, came unexpectedly and how she's having to navigate in this moment. With that being thought, I want to kind of use as a message today, I want to talk about I wasn't ready to say goodbye. Lord, speak. Your people need to hear. It was around 1991, and I was spending the summer with my father. When we had got reunited in my youth, my grandparents made sure that every summer I would spend time with him. Those are some of the best times of my childhood, just hanging out with my pops and my family, the Goodman side. If you ever get to meet them, they are the fun side of our family. I enjoy being little Charlie in those spaces. I enjoy being a kid. And growing up in that moment, I will admit to you one of the things that I really enjoyed because my dad had a true passion as well as me, absolutely loved music. It's about that time that I began to start to learn about music, start to hear about different genres, whether he was introducing me to Motown or R&B or different things that were happening. At that time, I'll also be honest with you, I considered myself someone who could sing pretty decently. I've kind of had to let that go as I've gotten older. But I was part of groups and I was singing songs and so I was always drawn to groups or singers that I thought really spoke and had some real talent. My favorite group growing up was Boys to Men. Enjoyed hearing their songs, their first album, Cooley High Harmony, was incredible knowing their story and all that. But there was a song that they sang that actually was a rendition of a song that had already been put out. It was a song entitled, It's So Hard to say goodbye to yesterday. We all know that song. Matter of fact, many of us perhaps tried to sing it, tried to get in right harmony, in right key. Matter of fact, we probably heard that song more than we wanted to throughout the years. It was a song not only for the precision for which they sang it, but also it was a song that you would hear regularly at talent shows. You would also hear them at graduations and yes, even at funerals. You would hear that song, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. And I admit as a kid, as I was introduced to that song, I would just sing the songs. I was enamored by the melody. I was just, just enthralled by how they put those things together. It wasn't until I got older that I really began to hone in, if you will, on the words. And no matter what the verses were, it was that chorus that still resonates in our heart. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. I will admit to you that as I've gotten older, as a pastor, having to navigate moments of grief, having to even navigate pain of my own, I realize that yes, saying goodbye is hard. But the real challenge is what happens when it's not just hard to say goodbye, but what happens when you're not ready to say goodbye. I ain't going to front this week I've sat in tension. There has been much pain that I've been wrestling with. I mean, with everything that we've been talking about, I still can't get that tragedy that happened in Buffalo off my heart. It's weighed me down in the ways that I just honestly feel so defeated. This racist, domestic terrorist attack by an 18-year-old white male as he walked into a grocery store and took lives of our seasoned saints and brothers and sisters who were just going about the everyday routine of going to the grocery store. I struggle, guys, because as I began to think about the tragedies we've been experiencing the last few years, it almost seems like, where can you go? That trauma and tragedy can't find you. Can't have Bible study in church. Can't go to the grocery store. Odd places that you would think are normative, that we should feel safe. And so I wrestled with that. I've been having to grieve with that. But I will admit to you, perhaps part of my tension in when moments like that raises up is the fact that oftentimes whenever those tragedies come, they like to parade us out there in front of the world because you know how we are as people. We're so forgiving and we're ready to move on. But I ain't going to front. I've been really impressed this week. My soul was helped when a son of one of the persons who passed away, a woman by the name of Ruth Whitfield, who found herself at the grocery store after leaving her husband well, they have been married 68 years. She just went by to drop and get some things and ultimately lost her life. 
That family this week had a press conference, and it was her son, Garnell Whitfield Jr., this former fire commissioner for Buffalo. He spoke about the unconditional love of his mother, but he also talked about this unexpected loss and how the family was struggling with it. I quote his words, and I want you to hear them as it has pierced my soul this entire week. He said, we're not just hurting, we're angry. We're mad. This shouldn't have happened. He said, we do our best to be good citizens, to be good people. We believe in God. We trust him. We treat people with decency. We love even our enemies, and you expect us to keep doing this over and over and over again. Forgive and forget. While the people we elect and trust and offices around this country do their best not to protect us, not to consider us equal, not to love us back. What are we supposed to do with all this anger and with all of this pain? I felt his heart. Perhaps for many of us collectively as a nation, we feel that it's well, but it begins to go to the core. What I saw in that moment was a son that was grieving the loss of a mother he was not ready to say goodbye to. I mean, as we have been navigated over the last few weeks, I know that it's been hard. I know that it has been triggering. And as your pastor, I've tried my best to be sensitive to how we deal with it. And I know, I know it's not been easy. And let me tell you, it has been just as hard as I've had to stand behind this pulpit every single week. Preparation has been difficult. It has been hard because here's the truth. Grief is hard and it's difficult. It's hard when the person you talk to every day goes away. It's hard when the person that you're used to seeing and being in their company goes away. It's hard when the person that cared about every single detail of your life is no longer there. Someone can testify grief is hard and it's difficult. Perhaps you're like me. I still have that number in my phone of those who've gone on. And I just can't bring myself to erase that contact. It's hard and it's difficult. It's hard when you need a hug from someone and you can't receive it anymore. It's it's hard when something happens in your life to celebrate and you don't have them to talk to. Grief is hard and it's difficult. It's hard and difficult when no one asks about them anymore. It's hard when they stop saying their name and saying, how are you doing? It's hard when you see family pictures or hear their voices and videos. It's hard. My brothers and sisters, when you just wish people could meet them instead of you trying to tell them how great they are by yourself. I've learned, my brothers and sisters, even for me, I know this may sound strange, but it is hard for me even personally to go home. To go home where my grandmother resides, who's been having to live with the loss of my grandfather, her husband, for 61 years. Can I tell you, it's hard for me to go home. His hat is still hanging in the closet. His clothes are still there. (laughs) It's difficult. And as much as I know she needs it, it is hard because you still want that person around. I mean, I know, I know we've been talking about it all this particular time. And I know for many of us, we got that theological jargon down. They're in heaven and that is great. And yes, we are certain of that, but that does not lessen the pain of it. And oftentimes what has made this hard and difficult is for many of us is the unexpected, the the last conversations we wish we would have had, the last thing we wish we could have said. And many of us perhaps are in that moment where we're figuring out, I just hope they know how much I love them. In a 2011 publication, an online one called Slate, they surveyed their readers. And what's interesting, this became one of the largest responded surveys that they ever had. This was a survey that they had put out, and this was it, what it was concerning, grief. And this is what they asked. They wanted to ask questions about how people are dealing with their grief. And as I came across this survey, I began to be honest with you, I began to resonate with the responses. They got 8,000 responses for at that time, which was a record. And it talked about how people were dealing with grief. One of the contributors who published the results is a psychologist who specifically studies grief. In reporting the results of the survey, she noted that one of the strangest aspects of grief is this gap, watch this, between what we experience privately and what we express to others publicly. She said oftentimes there's the tension because in public we put on a good face when in private we're really teared apart. 
She said the survey revealed a few things, and I wonder if you can resonate with some of these responses. She said one third of the responses reported they had experienced their loss eight or more years ago, suggesting the ongoing presence of the felt loss. She said only 7% of the mourners felt it was completely true that they received adequate support from others. A significant theme emerged in how people felt their grief made others uncomfortable. In other words, she said people grieving felt others rapidly tired of their sad mood, their bad days, and the support they did receive quickly waned under the expectation that they just move on. She said nearly 30% felt alone with their grief most of the time. And 13% said they fell alone in their grief all of the time. As we've been navigating over the last few weeks, I, I've been trying my best to paint a picture. We've been kind of talking about it. And I'll be honest with you, I've come to the conclusion and end of the series, not with some neat narrative or story, but one that I think really shines a light on oftentimes how you and I can deal with these unexpected losses. The text that we are lifting up today that I hope that you will read in, in totality is 2 Samuel chapter 21. It's one of the most endearing, but I must admit to you, thorniest passages of scripture. It's a text that we see King David early on in his ministry. He's now the leader of Israel. Now there is a famine in the land. And the famine has come because there has been a covenant broken between Israel and the Gibeonites. And David goes and he wants to talk to them. What is it that needs to happen? What has taken place is that the Gibeonites are still at odds with Israel because King Saul, the predecessor of David, had done something wrong to them. He had broken and reneged a promise to them. Because of a broken promise, now Israel was under this curse. A famine had come. David, as any good leader would want to do, he wanted to make amends. He needed to know what could they do to rectify this issue. And this is what the Gibeonites required. They needed the life of some of the descendants of Saul. Literally, they wanted some of Saul's sons to be executed. They needed a life in order to be taken so that they could have this covenant done. I understand what some of you are saying, and I understand because many of us try to find some sanctity or try to find some righteousness in every portion of Scripture. I, I'm not going to sit here and try to rectify or even tell you they did right. This is just the culture of that day. And King David now is obligated to break it. So what does he do? He offers up some of the descendants, sons and grandsons of Saul. The text tells us that seven Young men are chosen. Five of them come from a woman by the name of Merib and two from a woman named Ritzpah. Ritzpah is the concubine of Saul and the text tells us that she has to offer up two of her sons. The text says it's a gruesome manner. When we get to 2 Samuel chapter 21, it is an ugly death. They are hanged publicly. Their bodies continually to languish outside. This was one of the worst ways that you could die. And the text tells us that she has to respond to this moment. Can you imagine being a mother and seeing your sons hanging for the public view of everybody? It's one of the moments of scripture that it shows us the mother's love, but it is also one of the hardest moments in scripture to see her pain that she's wrestling with. That's why I'll be honest with you as as hard as the Bible can be sometimes, I, I appreciate the word of God because it begins to share with us the extremities of our emotions and it does not shirk away from the reality that there are things that happen that we just don't understand nor like. Because you and I could wrestle with the question, God, if you're so sovereign and amazing, why not spare her sons? Those are questions we ask and raise. They were not spared in our text. Seven sons had to be executed. By the time we conclude this passage, we don't hear any more of Ritzman. She literally seems to disappear from the canon. The moment that we only get to see Rispa is at her worst moments of pain. What happens when people only see you at your worst? What happens when people only see you at your lowest moment? And how she manages this moment, how she deals with this period when she was not ready to say goodbye. I think there's a few things. I just want to simply drop these today. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, 
I'm stumbling across the finish line. I hope you pray with your pastor. As I tried my best to read and explain this passage, it was painful. Because no matter whether you are, no matter your gender, no matter your demographic, all of us can sympathize with Ritzba. And if the truth be told, there are periods in life you're going to be Ritzba. That you're going to have to navigate and somehow figure out life when you're not ready to say goodbye. What Ritzbas am I talking to? That have had that experience. So what was it? If I could lift up a few things. If Ritzba could speak for us today. She would talk about her journey. This pain that she found herself in. This unexpected loss. And somehow in the pain. Ritzba has to make some peace. Let me share a few things with you today. Let me share a couple things that I hope and pray. Is going to help us. Once again it's not an easy thing. But it is a piece where I think that as we've been navigating grief, the nuances of it, the uncertainty of it, the uncomfortability of it, my hope and prayer is that whatever part of the journey you are in, be okay with it. Trust God in the totality of your faith to realize he's not just the God of the mountain, he's also the God of the valley. What is it that you and I can glean? Real quickly, let me give you a few thoughts, if you will. And I hope that you would jot these down. Once again, I'm, I'm concluding this series not with a neatly tied bow of a sermon or message. No, just some thoughts to think about. Just to lift up someone that when times get rough, that perhaps you can use 2 Samuel 21 as a reference scripture and story. Because sometimes grief is just grief. Sometimes it's just hard to say goodbye. First thing that I think that we can glean if we are in the shoes of Rich, but she teaches us that oftentimes in these moments when we are not ready to say goodbye, that this is what she shows us, that many times you got to make peace with finding the grace you need in your journey to move on. Now what if I told you that oftentimes grace is not just saving grace, but it's sustaining grace. That, that's the unique thing about the grace of God. It's not just to save us. And we shout and celebrate over a saving grace. But there's another grace entitled sustaining grace. It's exemplified in this passage. As we see these sons have been chosen by David. I'm, if you keep reading the earlier portions of the text. I, there is a portion where I can imagine she perhaps was a little hard because uh, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was looked over. David did not choose Mephibosheth because of a promise to Jonathan, and yet he chose her sons. A son was spared, but her son was chosen. That's a lot to deal with. And I know many of us don't want to be honest about it, but there are sometimes we are upset not just with the pain we have to feel, but when we feel like other people have been spared from that same pain. What happens when it's your mother that passes and another one mother gets healed? But what happens when it's your child that succumbs in the accident and the other one that's in the car is still alive? It gets hard when one is spared and yet the weight of the loss is on you. So on one hand, she has this issue. There's a son that was spared, but her two sons have to be taken. When you read this text, you'll know that there are seven sons. Two are Ritzpahs and five belong to Merab. Here is something unique that I need you to understand. Merit is lifted up and there is some interesting connection. She was perhaps um, also the one that could have potentially been David's wife. But she has five sons who get executed and Ritzpah has two. But we don't hear about Merab's journey. All we hear about is Ritzpah. Which teaches you and I that sometimes you can go through something and it be a completely different response to someone else's. We don't get no insight of Merab. We have no idea about how she responded to this. But we do get Ritzpah's issue. We see Ritzpah's pain and grief. We see her journey to try to move on. And my brothers and sisters, I think that they give us a wonderful picture 
that oftentimes you got to be careful because everyone just does not grieve or move on the same. Merib lost five sons, but we don't hear her story. But we hear Ritzpah's. At the end of the day, we get no mention of Merib, which I don't know there's a lot that we can conclude from that. Maybe she was more private in her grieving because Ritzpah becomes to be publicly mourning. We're unsure. We just see these two mothers and we only get to hear one side of Ritzpah. And I just want to talk to some Arabs out there who oftentimes, just because people don't see you or hear from you, we know you're grieving as well. Every portion of grief is not public and everyone doesn't deal with it the same way. But Ritzpah is the one that we focus on the text. Matter of fact, it's interesting to note that the Bible is very clear that she is also the concubine of Saul. In those days, regardless of how you want to view it, she was considered literally property. She was, in essence, part of the concubine of Saul. Can I make the argument that she's not just grieving her two sons, but she's also grieving the final connection she had with the father that she couldn't say goodbye to. If you go back and know how Saul died, Saul died in battle. He didn't have a chance to say goodbye to anyone. And so perhaps this grief is magnified by the fact not only does she have to face the loss of her sons, but also the loss and the reality that Saul is no longer there as well. Some of us know what it is to have one traumatic experience after the other. And that's what makes it hard. That's what makes it difficult. That's what makes it tough. Because maybe in this moment, that's why she couldn't rush to move on. Because there was the double impact of not saying goodbye, not just to her two sons, but also to Saul. And some of us honestly haven't even grieved for Saul. And now this has happened. And in life, I wish I could tell you that it would slow down enough for you to properly grieve each moment at a time. And part of the challenge that we struggle when it comes to us moving on is that many times the process is you're grieving one thing after the other. Maybe that's what has made this season so hard. And while some of us really honestly are trying our best, but moving on has been so difficult. Because not only perhaps are you mourning the loss of a loved one, maybe it's a loss of a job, maybe it's a loss of something else that became unexpected. I wish I could tell you that life would just be compartmentalized, that you could grieve this and then get over that and then have the opportunity. A lot of times we're grieving things in succession. But our text tells us, that God gives us the grace to move on. We're not told how long she stayed there. I can make the argument. We really are uncertain and unsure. But she comes during the barley season. The barley season comes. She stays out there until the rain does not, rain comes back. Some have suggested it could have been six to eight months that she stood in her position. What I simply want to tell you is grief takes time. Make peace with creating this grace you need to move on. But also RISPA gives us this, make peace with creating the space you need in expressing how you mourn. I told you this was a gruesome text. In order to make an example, in order for them to satisfy what they think is right, not only did they hang these sons, they kept them outside. It's disrespectful. That means they will be open to predators and other things that could come by that could once again desecrate their bodies. But Ritzpah does something that I think is so significant. She refuses to allow the memory or her sons to be desecrated in this time. She comes out there and she shoos the vultures away during the day. And at night, she stays on watch to make sure that the wild animals do not come. It's something interesting that many of us can testify that here's what make grief also extremely difficult is when you still have to function while you're grieving. What happens when you still can't take time off? 
What happens when the job is calling to say, hey, we need you back on the job? Well, what happens when the family says, hey, I know you're grieving, but we still have things we need to do. Here she was. She still had to function. She had to get up in the morning, shoo the vultures away. She had to make sure that she was around at night to make sure the wild animals were not there. And I'm sympathetic to people uh, who have to learn how to live and grieve at the same time. So it makes it hard. It would be so much easier if God would stop the world and let us get off, but that's not how this thing works. So how does she protect herself? There is something there that I think is significant because there is something powerful that takes place. The text tells us in that moment she's operating, she's trying her best, but literally she is by herself. That's a powerful story I read recently. An editorial by David Brooks in the New York Times entitled, What Do You Say to the Sufferer? This is what he wrote in the op-ed. Rabbi Elliot Kokla once described a woman with a brain injury who would sometimes fall in the floor. People around her would rush to immediately get her back on her feet before she was quite ready. She told Kukla, I think people rush to help me up because they are so uncomfortable with seeing an adult lying on the floor. But what I really need is for someone to get down on the ground with me. Some of us have felt that. And we've had people try to get us up too early. Try to tell us to move on too early. But sometimes we don't need you to help us up. Get on the ground with us. Notice how she prepares herself. The text tells us in the New Living, they call it the burlap, but typically what she used as a tent or bed was sackcloth. Whenever you read scripture, sackcloth is, is paramount or symbolic and parallel with grief. You see ashes and sackcloth. These were common utensils of grief. And note what she does. She knows what season she's in. So what does she do? She unfolds her sackcloth. I appreciate that. Because she's not afraid to grieve. And many of us keeping our sackcloth tucked under our arms. And maybe what we ought to do is unroll it. Spread it out. Notice what she does. She spreads out her sackcloth on a rock. <laughs> Whoa, if I had time. She spreads it out on something that could support her. Something that could be strong when she wasn't strong. She knew where to place her grief. I, if I had time, if there's someone in Tab Global or maybe at in-person worship, I want you to know I'm not telling you to unfold your sackcloth just anywhere, but just unfold it on a rock. There is something that you can unfold it on that can provide the strength that you need. I know it's hard and I know it's painful, but there is a rock, a rock that since can sustain us in our moment. There's a rock that can be with us. She unfolds her rock. She lays it out. And that's what provided her strength for the entire time. I told you earlier that some scholars believe she perhaps was out there six to eight months. And you're asking the question, how could she be sustained so long? Because she knew where to lay her sackcloth. The rock doesn't mean that the moment is over. The rock just means he'll give you what you need while you're still in the moment. Maybe that's the space. What I'm telling each and every one of you, just as I've had to tell myself, it's best to make sure that you find the space you need to mourn. Do not be afraid in this season to unfold your sackcloth. Because if you don't, how many of you know it can be catastrophic? As a kid, we used to do crazy stuff because we were kind of jokesters. And so every now and again, we would find ourselves at the family reunion and we would take soda cans, shake them up real good, place them back in the cooler, sit on the side, Waiting for the next person to come, pick that soda can up. I know, I know you're judging me. I can already tell. But man, it was something to see those cans be open. The person would be 
unexpected and this can would then spurt in their eyes. The contents would come out. Why? Because something on the inside had not been properly dealt with. So when it finally came time to be opened, it couldn't be controlled. But what if I told you that's like grief? And the more you try to bottle it in, the more you try to keep it together, the more you try to make sure you're okay, just know there's going to come a day. If you don't roll that sackcloth off, that it's going to explode all on you. That's the third thing, and this is it. Make peace with settling on a place that you need to honor their memory. She stays out there. We're not giving them the time frame, but it is rather a lengthy time. Until finally David gets word and sees for himself Ritzba. He sees how she's responding in grief. Something moves David. There's a lot of conjecture. I'll be honest with you. If I was to unpack this in an exegesis class, there is some uncertainty what really spurred David in this moment to act. Some say perhaps he was tired of seeing Ritzba debase herself that way. Some say perhaps he was being compassionate, empathetic. All I know is that his heart was moved. Something happened to David, and David decides that her suffering should end. This is what he does. He goes and he sends some people to Jabez Gilead. These were the people that had successfully taken the bones of Saul and Jonathan from the Philistines. The Philistines were trying to humiliate Saul and Jonathan, and these Jabez Gilead people went there to honor his presence, but they had kept the bones of Saul and Jonathan. And at this moment, David recovers them, gets the bones of Saul and Jonathan, but that's not all he does. He takes those seven sons, that had been executed. He gets their bodies and he gets their bones. And this is what David does to honor the grieving mother Rizpah. He buries their bones. Now you have to understand why this is crucial in this time of antiquity. To, to have one's body exposed brought disrepair and disrespect to the family. Burial would be a final moment of memorial. And because of Ritzba's grief, David responds. He sees her suffering and realizes we can't keep them out. So he grabs Saul and Jonathan's body. He takes the seven bodies of the sons and he buries them at the father's tomb of Saul. Kish's tomb he buries. He takes it in the promised land and buries these Bones. I know why you can't shout because you forgot I told you Ritzba is a concubine. By all intents and purposes, her sons should not even be recorded with the rest of the lineage of Saul. But because of her suffering, her never-ending grief, David responds by putting their bones with Saul's bones and making it a memorial that will go down and put them in the same plane as this royal dynasty. Because she continued to mourn and was in suffering, David responds by honoring her sons beyond their death. So now their memory shall live on in honor. This thing spoke to me because it reminded me that part of what continues to keep us is when we create that place for their memories to still be there. Can I tell you, my brothers and sisters, and this is my closing remarks, I know it hurts and I know it is difficult, but as long as you got the memories, people never truly die. Have you ever looked up at night and seen the stars? You do realize that what you're looking at is illumination that has come from some entity in space that has died on. By the time we view the light of the star, that star, that celestial body has died. But just because it has died doesn't mean it's not still shining. And maybe that's what keeps us 
and allows that memory to keep on is when you create that place and space for that memory to be honored. I'm done when I tell you this. I was figuring out what does this look like and talked to a good friend of mine, Dr. Rod Parks, one of my dear friends. And we were talking and he was helping me to understand. He said his grandmother used to make peace lilies for the church. Anybody grew up in the old school church, you know that you would have these peace lilies, these beautiful flowers that represent hope and prosperity. And they would oftentimes be given to people in times of grief. People would have these peace lilies. Matter of fact, my grandmother has quite a few of them. And during the funerals of loved ones, she keeps them in her house. I can go home now and there's a peace lily from my grandfather's funeral. There's a peace lily from my Uncle Ronnie's funeral. There's the Uncle Robert's funeral. There's peace lilies from some of her siblings. And I always wondered about peace lilies. I never really seen them outside. I didn't know where they came from. And that's when my friend Dr. Rod Parks helped me. He said his grandmother would grow these peace lilies for the church and so that whenever the moment come, they would be given to people as memorials and things in times of grief. And he says, goody, here's the thing that most people don't understand, that peace lilies are grown in the dark. These are flowers of hope and prosperity and sympathy and they are grown, watch this, in the dark. I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that sometimes God gives you and I peace, even from dark places. As we stand together, and if you're in the tab global, we ask that you would center yourself. It's hard to say goodbye to yesterday. But we still can provide honor for those that have transitioned on. I don't want you to think you're odd because you still have mementos and memorials for your loved one. Right in my office, I still have the obituary of my grandfather. I still have his Bible. Those things give me comfort. It may sound strange to other people, but that's what I need. And I've learned in grief, you have to do what you need to do to keep you through it. Maybe in all of this, I hope that you have received this one thing. If you haven't gotten a lot, it's been, it's been a tough series. But what I have hoped that you have gleaned from it is not only is grief personal, but also know that God can still be found in our grief. Listen, tab in person, let us pray for our tab global family as we prepare to transition them. Pray for them. There are many throughout this world who have been viewing, who have sent messages and talked about how it's been hard and difficult. God, we thank you for those who are part of our tab global family who've had to navigate with us over the last few weeks through grief what it means to push through tears and live in the silence of Saturday and never throw away your hearts. And even today when we admit it, that it is hard. And sometimes we weren't ready to say goodbye. So Lord, we just pray for our families, our brothers and sisters and many others who are still navigating through grief. We want you, God, to be with them. To remind them that even when we got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that you'll still be with us. So, Lord, bless them, keep them, comfort them is our prayer. In Jesus' name.